All righty. Well, I want to say again, welcome to everybody. We have a great uh, message plan for us tonight, or I should say God has a great message plan for us tonight. And I want to welcome all of you to uh, allow me to minister to you tonight. This that I'm going to share tonight, I'm, I'm just going to believe uh, something significant is going to, uh, what's the right word, be communicated, be imparted. Uh, be transmitted. The, the message tonight, of all the messages God's ever given me, uh, is probably one of, um, to say it's my favorite but isn't even right, because I have, I have some that are favorites that I like to do because they're fun, they're exciting. But this on humility, uh, as I'm calling in the key to an up in heaven, is a life-changing uh, message. It was for me, I mean, just dramatically changed my life. And um, most of you know that I have the classic teaching that God gave me in 1998 that I recalled what God called it when he gave it to me on Mother's Day, and that is the five keys to the supernatural. And I actually had another message planned, and what I had planned didn't happen because God uh, overrode the plan and just literally took over the service and spoke through me this message that summed up at that point 20 years of study in the supernatural and looking at literally uh, how do we do what Jesus did? How do we walk in that level of, of power and glory and ability to walk on the water and, and see the weather patterns change and, and to see you know, people raised from the dead as he did. Uh, how, how does that happen? Because there's things that we need to do to understand. And uh, so that, that's been my quest, my, my cry, uh, ever since God spoke it to me in 1979 that he said that um, he called me to study in this area of, of the miracles and to recognize that when Jesus said, that we would do what he did as a believer and greater, it, he meant it. So I cried my heart all these years and still is, uh, how did he do that? And uh, real simply, God summed it up here recently, a few years ago, and he said, well, if you want to do what Jesus did, then do what Jesus did. So that's pretty simple. But on, on Mother's Day, 1998, uh, as I got into the public to speak, God took over ministered to me, through me, I should say, what well, to me as well, but uh, this message, Five Keys to the Supernatural, and tonight we're looking at key number three, which is humility, and the other keys, key number one is sensitivity, number two, obedience, we just looked at that for a number of weeks now, uh, key number three is humility, key number four, knowledge, and key number five, motivation. Why do you want to do what Jesus did? Or uh, more uh, literally, why do you want the power of God or the glory, the miracles and the signs and wonders? Or as a business person, why do you want the wealth of the wicked? Uh, so all of these come to a, you know, point number five, motivation. And what, what's the purpose of it all? What's the motivation of your heart? And the primary motivation of heaven is compassion. And uh, compassion is the awareness of the suffering of another and the willingness to do something about it. But again, tonight we're, we're on key number three, humility. And with each one of these keys, there's a lot of life experiences that God has taught me through. Uh, there's a lot of study, a lot of uh, Greek and a lot of Hebrew, as it would be, and visions, dreams. Uh, because in my quest, God has graced me with uh, many visions, many dreams. Uh, I call them all visions because young men have visions. But uh, in my lifetime, I've only had one open vision. And of all the visions I've had, uh, one, actually two, I can say this, are the most significant, most life-changing. We talked about one of those. And that was the, the one that talks about, uh, we mentioned it last week actually, on sensitivity, where God showed me about going through a barrier and that we were on the edge of a spiritual breakthrough. 
coming into a move of the Spirit of God unlike anything the world has ever seen, signs, wonders, and miracles beyond what you can imagine. We're there. I mean, I believe we're there right now. God gave me that uh, in, in the 22 years, 23 years ago. But we're now at that place where I really believe we're about to see the body of Christ rise up to a place we've been prepared for. But tonight we're going to focus on humility. And the vision that I'm going to share with you tonight is uh, life-changing. And I just want to pray as I, before I get into the vision and into the ministry of the Word tonight to believe that I, I'll be able to communicate it with you as, as an oracle, a, a mouthpiece for the Lord, and that there will be an anointing that will flow out of me. And, and I believe it is because I can feel it. And, and I know we don't go by feelings, but uh, I've been at this long enough to know that... Uh, Feelings are significant, and there's a great feeling now. I can feel the, the movement of the Spirit, and uh, I want to pray and, and believe that it's going to move in you as it is moving in me and being released from me to you to impart some wisdom and knowledge and uh, operation of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this time now. I pray, Father, that... Uh, the anointing, the, the, the work of your Holy Spirit in me would be you know, flowing in such a way like a river to each one that is listening or watching, whether they're watching live or the recorded version. Father, I know it really doesn't make a difference because the anointing is embedded in the, the recording as it would be. But Father, I'm, I'm praying that there would be a... Uh, a work of your spirit that would reach deep into the heart and bring forth a, a, an understanding that would cause this message tonight to take root and produce a harvest for your glory. And I pray, Father, as we're coming into a time as unlike we, things we've ever seen before, that this would help each one of us to live under a greater openness of your heaven because i know lord you're 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 moving right now in in, in a way of, of heaven invading earth and and literally the, the lord's prayer being fulfilled of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven so help us lord to be in that place we need to be to experience the fullness of the life that you have planned for us for your glory give us ears to hear father Jesus' name. Amen. Woo! Woo Don't go by feelings or praise God. It sure does feel good to feel good. Amen. Well, let me share some scriptures with you. I, I put these into a document. I, I thought it might be quicker to uh, just bring up a document and try to go from verse to verse in, in the scripture. So let me um, bring up the document here. And uh, just a few scriptures on humility. Again, we're looking here at the third key and the five keys to the supernatural. And, you know, some things, again, we're going to learn by, by study of, of the Word and the revelation that God gives to us by the Spirit. And then other wisdom and knowledge are going to come to us by vision or dream or prophetic word or different ways that God communicates supernaturally with us. So we'll go there next. But we can see some scriptures here. First Peter 5, it says uh, in verse number 5, Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. Can you say that with me? Be clothed with humility. Why? He says, For God resist the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now we're going to see here, matter of fact, I'm just going to turn the screen down here to another verse, kind of a parallel verse here, and that's James 4, 6, where it says, He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, 
but gives grace to the humble. So, you know, we all, praise God, we need grace. Grace is, uh, I love Charles Capp's definition of this. Uh, grace simply, by definition, is favor. But Charles Capps, uh, I think, so well articulated it with this definition. It's God's ability to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Amen? His ability to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. See, that's God opening a door. And you've heard me say this before, but, you know, we can open doors on our own accord. And, you know, based on our, our varying skills, uh, myself, I'm, I'm very skilled as a salesperson, as a marketer in, in promotion, and uh, the ability of persuasion, which are all great attributes that help me with the Word of God as an evangelist to persuade and to, to sell the gospel as it would be. But in the natural, that same, that same gift works. And uh, so I can become, a, or I am, a very professional, ex experienced, successful salesperson. So when it comes to the ministry, it's a real challenge for me to set aside those natural skills. And I've had to learn this. And it was a hard lesson, and God helped me to learn it in different ways. But uh, literally when I started the ministry, and we didn't have any brochures. I didn't have a business card because God says we're gonna. He's gonna do the promoting for me. He's gonna do the marketing for me. And so, literally, it was many years before I even put in my first business card. But what I recognized that even though I was trying not to, I still had uh, the propensity, as it would be, to make stuff happen. And I've heard me tell this story before about going to Russia. And uh, God has given me the vision back in 1983 to see a million people get saved, discipled, and serving God. And uh, where I was going and where God has sent me to, going to literally Wisconsin every, uh, every month, I would literally drive to Wisconsin for a week or two, do meetings up there. This is back in 1985, 86. I do meetings for a week or two, come back for a week or two. Sometimes I had to make a little extra money, and then I'd go up and do it again. So I'd be in Wisconsin for two trips per month. Did that for, well, I'm still doing that, but back then I did it uh, twice a month, and that was the only place I, I would go to minister for years. And I kept saying to God, God, if we got every person in every church saved, count the pregnant women twice, I mean, it'll take us 100,000 years at the rate, you know, we're getting people saved. How are we ever going to get a million people saved? And all God would say to me repeatedly is just be faithful. Just be faithful with a little and, uh, you know, do what I tell you to do. And so, anyway, I uh, sometimes would try to get ahead of God. And I did that with going to Russia in 1991, 1992, I guess it was. Because a great opportunity was in Russia. I mean, the Iron Curtain came down, and uh, just great opportunity. So I knocked on doors. I literally used my skills instead of letting God go before me. And I, I made contacts, and I, I, I did it. And it was successful. We went to Russia, and um, my wife went with me, and our children's minister went with me. We were there for like two and a half weeks. Saw great numbers of people get saved had a pastor's conference, uh, did a lot of ministry, and it was a very, very successful trip. God blessed it. But all that said, I opened the door. I made it happen. And when I left Russia, very clearly, the door shut. And, you know, um, what I've recognized is doors we open, we have to hold them open. Doors God opens, no man can close them. So the point of all this, well, let me, before I go, go there, the, the next year, Africa came to me. I had nothing to do with it. And it was very clearly God opening the door, and he's still opening the door. Uh, and we've been now been to Africa 30 times. It's a very, very supernatural difference when God's opening the door. Now we're having the same experience in greater. I mean, matter of fact, I've never, ever seen anything like the doors that God's opening right now as he is 
in uh, Grenada in the Caribbean. And I know we're going to continue to go around the world, but for uh, a portion, a good portion of our time, God is doing something in Grenada beyond anything. I mean, I mean, just imagine the prime minister of a country inviting you in to mentor, to disciple his constituency and, and teach the silent truths of God's word and applying them to business to get them gainfully employed, financially independent, uh, and very excited and looking forward for us to building a program down there. That, that's a God thing. And then to know that we can take this model and replicate it in other countries it's, it's a door God has opened. Now, God wants to open doors for you. I'm telling you now, I know this is it's like a prophetic word to you right now. When we're living under this open heaven, and we want, we want to go to that place tonight, there's things that we do to set the stage for that, for those uh, blessings of God, the doors to open to prosperity, to abundance, to to great victories and, and, and breakthroughs and moves of the Spirit with signs, wonders, and miracles. I mean, we're talking about God doing things that you don't even ask for them. And, and you don't really need to ask because God knows what you need. But it's all about, as we're going to get into this tonight, the condition of your heart. And this is what humility, this is the core of humility, that you want to be the man or the woman that God made you to be. And it says in Ephesians 1, 4, that before the foundation of the world, that he called you to be holy and blameless. And it's humility that is going to help you to invoke God's grace to do this. Because everything we're doing to, to accomplish God's will, we need his grace. His ability to do what we could never do. Hallelujah. Amen? And sometimes, you know, we, we think things are good because we're, we're gifted. And, and that, you know, this is a challenge I've had. And unlike many people, when they get saved, you know, they come out of a place of uh, hitting a wall at the bottom. Well, when I got saved, that was at the top. I got everything money could buy. I was lacking nothing. And everything money, any man could want. And then, I mean, a lot of it I shouldn't have wanted because it was lustful. But the point is I was very, very successful because God graced me with a calling and natural abilities that would become his abilities to use. Uh, um, but he uh, brought me to a place, I mean, I, I, I could make stuff happen. But I've recognized as great as the talents, the gifts, the callings that are in my DNA, whew, what he can do, what he is doing, is it's far beyond anything you can ask, think, or imagine. And I know that, I know this is true for you. There's, there's opportunity before you that is greater than anything you could imagine, that God is going to perform his word. I mean, as an example, getting out of debt. You know, you look at your circumstance right now and you might say there's no way in the natural to, to get out of debt. But see, with God, nothing is impossible. And the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous and he wants to open doors, open heaven, and, and create pathways and doors of opportunity for the impossible. You know, whether, you know, it's like, uh, I always think about this because I went, I went to Bible school with... Uh, I remember like Beverly Hillbillies. Well, I went to in L.A. May Clampett, you know, the, the, the ditzy blonde. Well, I went to Bible school with her. And uh, Donna Douglas is her name. But, uh, you know, in that episode of, of, or in that series, you know, uh, Jed, I guess, shot a, an oil well or something and uh, became multimillionaires. Well, they were nobodies that became a somebody just by what would appear to be an accident. Well, you know, God can do that kind of a thing and far greater, and we're seeing people, you know, just recently, uh, a couple of years ago, somebody in California was out digging in their backyard, and they, they found a, a buried treasure worth uh, lots and lots and lots and lots of money. Anyway, I want to come back. The, the point here is, you serve a God of miracles, and this is the whole point 
of when I started on my quest, see, Jesus did the miraculous. And when he needed money, supernatural provision told Peter to go, go fishing and pull out a fish. And what happened? Supernatural money. And uh, that's one of the miracles that Jesus did, just like multiplying the loaves and the fishes and or a, a, a miraculous catch, you know, that uh, was worth with a fortune. These are the kind of things God wants to do and uh, take you to places you've never been before. Well, how do we get there? That's what we want to talk about tonight. Well, condition of your heart, humility, and uh, God, God is able to give you a grace I mean, we all have a measure of grace. By grace, we get saved through faith. But see, what these scriptures are telling us is there's opportunity for more. God gives more grace. He gives a greater grace to the humble. That's the whole point here. So he, he resists the proud. And we're going to look at this tonight because, see, a proud person uh, doesn't have a submission to God. They, you know, they, they, they love God, but they're not submitted to him. And there, there's a difference when you submit yourself to his lordship. Uh, it's different than accepting him as savior. Um, and praise God, you know, for the people that get into heaven by the skin of their teeth, per se, like we say in Job, but others like Peter would say, have an abundant entry. And that's what I want to help you to have an abundant entry into heaven. And uh, so let's look at this. Let's go farther here. But the, so the key point here, you want, here's a key takeaway point is God, because of humility, the condition of your heart is going to put you in a place for God to do more. He'll do more for you than he'll do for others. And recognizing this as well, a lot of Christians uh, are walking with a level of pride. And pride would say, as an example, when God gives you an instruction that says, you know, uh, pray without ceasing, or praise him from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, or to feed on his word your, your daily bread. Well, these are instructions that we see in God's word that tell us to pray, to praise, to read, to study, to hide God's word in her heart. And a lot of people don't do that. And they don't do it because they don't honor God. They don't recognize that he is smarter than we are. And when we take that position, well, I don't have to pray. I mean, you know, I, I, I prayed a couple of days ago, or I don't really have to praise. I, I really don't have to read or study. It's a form of pride because you're you're saying that God, um, God's word is invalid per se, even though he says you need to do it. You're smarter than him. That's a form of pride. And when, and disobedience, <laughs> and remember last week's lesson on obedience, the willing and obedient eat the best of the land. So it's a condition of your heart. I, I define humility as like a two-edged sword. There's two sides to it. One side is being teachable, uh, being open to instruction or correction, which a lot of people aren't. I mean, you know, and I see this, I, uh, I'm a repetitive kind of a teacher. I'll, I'll teach some things repeatedly over and over and over again because I know that it takes a, a good number of times to get something from your head to your heart. And many people have the knowledge, but they don't have the revelation. So what happens with a lot of people is like in a meeting, they might say, well, I heard that before. And when they, when they say that, I heard that before, they're not as in tune to what's being said. And they'll kind of let their mind wander a little bit and, and, you know, and go different places than the meeting. So they're missing something. And it's, it was a form of, of pride. And the pride there would be, I know that. I'm not, you know, I don't need to hear that again. I've already heard that once. And then when I hear that or I think about that, I always think, think of uh, my favorite instructor in Bible school uh, was uh, Doug Jones. And Doug Jones was Brother Hagen's uh, crusade director and uh, traveled with him 
but he also uh, did all of the editing of his tapes. And Doug Jones told us one day he, he knew Dr. Hagen's messages so well. I mean, he could, he could repeat them word for word because talk about repetitive. He was really repetitive and tell the same exact story and the, I mean, even all the hand motions. I mean, Doug had it all down. But, and so he heard it live, then he heard it by recording and editing. And he said, but one day, after <laughs> hundreds of times of hearing, per se, the same message on Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24, he got it. It's like it hit him going from his head to his heart. And, you know, that's when revelation really happens. But many people miss it because they, they're not open. They're not open to really intently listening and being open to, to wisdom or correction. Uh, and sometimes it's because, you know, we, we get stuck in, in our ways and, oh, that's the way grandma did it. That's the way, you know, wh whoever did it or somebody in the great, you know, this is the way they taught it to me. So, you know, they're not open to correction or instructions. Well, that is a form of pride. So the other side of humility to me, as I've studied it out, is what we're really going to focus on tonight is the, the recognition of God is God. And that what he says is important to us. And we need to, to submit ourselves to him and um, know how much we need him. I mean, we, literally, you and I, we're only alive because of his grace. We, we only have another day here on this planet because he's graced us with another day. We only have what we have, whatever it is, because of his grace. And so what we're going to be looking at tonight in this study is that perspective, that need to recognize our need for God and submitting ourselves to him. Amen. So let, let me keep moving along here. So again, let me, let me my perfect God, the verse that we were reading here, uh, go back up here to 1 Peter 5. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to unto the elder. Yea, all of you subject one to another and be clothed with humility. You know, to, to be clothed, I don't look at, I'm not sure if it's a Greek word, but I think it's in duo, oftentimes is, but, but it's, it's putting on. It's something in Christianity is a put on. We never thought of it before, but we do have to put on the garment of praise. We do have to put on uh, the armor of God. We have to put on uh, the bowels of compassion. It's, it's something you choose to do, and, and that put on is right here, of being described as being clothed. We have to purpose to dress ourselves, to clothe ourselves with this condition of our heart. And, uh, you know, the heart really is an interesting subject of study, but it's something you have to purpose to do. We'll leave it at that. For God, it says again, resist the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Looking here in the cross-reference to being clothed with humility, Isaiah 57, 15, it says, For thus says the high and exalted one, who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. In order to receive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Whew. To revive the heart of the contrite. See, this is what God wants to do. He wants to revive us. And uh, he wants to bring us to a place of the first Adam. Jesus came to restore everything that was lost in the fall. And he's about that process right now in a very big way to revive us, to bring us back to a place God created us for. Amen. So let's go on here. To revive means, it's, by the way, it's the Hebrew word kaya, and it means to live, to have life, to remain alive, to sustain life, to live 
prosperously, to live forever, to be quickened, to be alive, to be restored to life or health. That is, you know, that sounds a lot like John 10.10 10 to me, where Jesus says, I come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant to go beyond superior in quality, super abundant in quantity, by implication excessive. excessive. This, is, this is what the Bible's telling us here. God wants to do for you and I. He wants to revive us. That means to make us alive, to have life, and to remain alive, to sustain us, to, to live prosperously, to live forever, to be quickened, to be alive, to be restored to life or health. God wants you perfect, quickened by his Holy Spirit, that you're lacking nothing, spirit, soul, or body. Glory to God. Uh, from the Living Bible, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of the Living Bible, but every so often, I, I just like the way it puts it into an easy to understand, you know, paraphrase. So, from the Living Bible, the high and the lofty one who inhabits eternity, the Holy One, says this, I live in that high and holy place where those who with contrite Humble spirits dwell, and I refresh the humble and give new courage to those with repentant hearts. Now, the, the reason I like this, because again, the key to an open heaven is the condition of your heart. In the condition of the, of the heart that God wants us to have according to his word is to be holy, to be holy as he is holy. And obviously, every day we're going to fall short. We're we're imperfect, but we're being made perfect. But the way we're going to um, reach a higher level is by setting uh, the vision as it would be. I, I think of a, of a temperature in a room uh, is regulated by a thermostat. And on, on the thermostat, you have a thermometer, and the thermometer tells you what the temperature is. But the thermostat is what changes the temperature, but when you change the thermostat, it takes a while for the systems to cause the room temperature to change. Well, that's the same thing with your heart. We have to set the thermostat of our heart to a position of holy, being holy, being blameless, as we were created for. Now, when you have that, you're going to recognize every day you're going to fall short. You're, you're going to have some bad thoughts. You're going to maybe say some bad things. You're, you're maybe going to get... Uh, maybe kind of self-centered, you're going to get off the mark, and, and maybe you're not putting time, you know what you need to, into, into feeding on the Word, or spending time meditating and hiding God's Word in your heart. So the idea here is you recognize your shortcomings, you recognize your faults, you recognize your sin as it would be, and you're quick to repent. That's, the, that's an idea here. You're quick to repent. Can you say that? I'm quick to repent. Amen. And that's kind of what's paraphrasing here says, is that God's going to revive us. Why? Because we have a repentant heart. We, we, we recognize we fall short, but we recognize that by His grace we can do better. By His Holy Spirit empowering us, we can reach a higher level. So what do we do? We, we recognize our need for his help. And that's the other side of the sword or the second side of the coin to humility. We recognize our desperate need of him. And this is what came to me in the vision. I'll share with you in a few minutes here. A couple more verses here. Isaiah 66, 2. It says, For my hand made all of these things. Thus all things came into being, declares the Lord. But to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit, who trembles at my word. Hallelujah. To he who trembles. See, that is a fear of God that we recognize we don't measure up in ourselves. So what are we going to do? We're, we're going to be quick to repent and say, God, help me to get to a higher level. Help me to overcome this thing in my life, this weakness, this area of, of distraction, whatever it happens to be, you, you, you are sincere to, in your heart to be needing God's help. And you're, you're seeing the vision of what he wants you to have 
So he got, he got something to work towards. Psalm 37, verse 1, 11, I'm sorry, it says this. But the humble will inherit the land and will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Whew. Glory to God. Will delight themselves in abundant prosperity. Now he's talking about you again. He's talking about what he wants for you to have abundant prosperity. Amen. This is what Jesus came to give you. A life, a Zoe life that is more abundant. Praise God. Well, let me share with you, let me check my time here, uh, the vision that God gave me and uh, wrap some teaching around the vision. Now, you never want to teach people uh, based on a dream or a vision, but the value is the truth that the dream or the vision represents. And what I'm going to share with you is a vision that God gave me in 1983 that, again, radically, radically changed my life. Let me put this uh, document here away. And let me open up here a PowerPoint presentation. I can find it here real quickly. There it is. I'm not the greatest artist or ability to put things together, but uh, this is kind of a, a sketch that I did, a, a drawing I did in my, my drawing program to kind of help you to understand the vision that God gave me. Well, what was happening the day that God gave me the vision is I was on the platform here. If you can imagine over here in the, on the platform here, I'm, I'm this guy in the middle. And uh, there's the pastor and the associate pastor and me were on the platform. We're having a worship service, and it was just a wonderful worship service. And as I'm looking out over the congregation, what happens is the roof disappears. <laughs> I mean, literally, and you can see here as I illustrated here in this drawing, the, the roof was completely gone. Now, we were new to Oklahoma. I'd been here less than excuse me, a year at that point. And dear friends of ours, a oh, oh, dear friend of mine who worked for the National Weather Service, a leading meteorologist uh, at the time, uh, kind of acclimated us to Oklahoma. And he said, David, where are you moving to? <clears throat> it's called Tornado Alley. And tornadoes come. And he gave us some, you know, some understanding of that. But he told us that one of the things tornadoes do is they take off roofs. And uh, so literally, um, when, when this happened, my first thought was, I mean, I didn't know. I never had an open vision before. And an open vision is when you're wide awake, you're completely alert, you're completely aware of what's going on. And I'm, you know, I didn't know, because I never had this happen before or since, uh, what was going on. So I'm kind of in a state of all. If you could have seen me, I would have been probably a gawker because my... I'm looking up and our roof's gone, our ceiling's gone, and I'm like, oh, what happened? And, and you know, so I'm gawking at, at, at this, and I'm not recognizing it was a vision, and my first thought was a tornado took our roof off. But I didn't hear the sound of a train coming through. And then I'm looking at the congregation, and I'm wondering why no one else is concerned or no one else is you know yelling and hollering the fact is our roof is gone so it, it took me a moment as it would be to recognize and, and it wasn't like a, like a minute of time it's fractions of a seconds but all these thoughts go through your mind that rapidly but anyway i very quickly realized this was not uh, a natural thing something supernatural was happening and as soon as that happened I, I settled down, and then God showed me this gigantic sphere of light. I mean, we're talking a gigantic sphere of light over the church. And it's kind of hard to explain it. I mean, this doesn't do it justice. Uh, it was so big. I mean, it was like bigger than the sun, farther away probably than the sun, but close enough to touch almost. And it was just kind of a, a weird unique phenomena but I saw this gigantic sphere of light 
overhead. And then what I saw are beams of light that were coming out of the, uh, the, the uh, sphere of light. Oops, I'm on the wrong one. That's why it came to science again. So what happened is the, these beams of light were coming down and they were touching various people in the congregation. And I don't know the exact number. I, was, I didn't count them per se. There was probably 70 to 100 people uh, in the congregation, probably more like 70 to 80 people in the congregation this particular Sunday. And I'm going to say no more than eight, probably 10% of the people had uh, this beam. But it was very clear the, the, the people were connected by a ray of light to this sphere of light. And I'm looking at this and wondering what it is. And God spoke to me and he said, what you're seeing is my throne room of grace. You're seeing my glory around my throne. And what you're seeing is provision coming from me to them. So, you know, this is where, to me, the whole concept of an up in heaven comes from because I saw it in an open vision. I saw heaven literally providing supernatural touches to a handful of people that were in the congregation. And I, I asked God, I said, as I'm watching this, what is it? What, what, what's coming? What's happening here? And he said to me, one person is getting healing. Now, they're not, they're not there standing, praying, and asking me for healing. He said, they're worshiping me in spirit and truth. And one person, just because of grace, just because of God's goodness, was providing healing to one of those people. And then another person was getting a financial breakthrough. Some, something of, of great financial significance was being provided for them. And I want to underscore here that one of the things God really impressed me with, and that is that people weren't asking for this. Their, their mind and their heart wasn't saying, oh God, give me, oh God, I need. They, they were in the service just, they were humble. They were, they, they were worshiping God in spirit and truth. And so one person was getting a financial breakthrough. And he said to me, another person was having a work done in their marriage. There was, you know, there was a, a, a contention and in, in, in marriage problems of serious nature. And they were getting a, a, a breakthrough. They were getting a supernatural restoration in, in their marriage. Another person that was in business, he said, was getting a breakthrough. God was supernaturally opening a door, uh, doing something for them to have a level of prosperity, blessing, provision uh, to no effort of their own per se, other than worshiping the Lord. They were worshiping God. And it, it was really awesome to watch it. And <clears throat> Then I looked up and to see what I was getting. And when I looked up to see what I was getting, there was no beam over me. And you can see there, <laughs> made an arrow, there's me. And there was no beam. I, I, I wasn't getting anything. And I, I said, God, where's mine? Where, where's my supernatural provision? And he said, you're not worshiping me as these other people are in an attitude of humility. And I said, God, how could you say that? How, how? I mean, I was actually angry. My, I mean, you know, lasted all for a moment, but I mean, I was angry. I, I was offended. And I said, God, how can you say that? I, mean, I left a job back in 1982 to go into the ministry. I was making over $100,000 a year and had everything, again, money could buy, and beautiful home on the lake, I mean, just everything. And I left all of that to go into the ministry. And when we came into the ministry, moved to Oklahoma, now I'm in Bible school at this time, so I'm working a half a day, or I'm working a whole day, I'm going to Bible school half a day, and I'm working a whole day. But, but beyond that, I'm involved in this church, I'm on the pastoral team, not getting paid anything for this, 
Friday nights, I'm having a Bible study in my home. Um, I'm, I'm in charge of the breakfast in this church. I'm in charge of evangelism, going out and doing outreach. I mean, I'm serving God. I, I'm sacrificing. I'm doing all these things. So I was offended. I'm Honestly, I, I was offended. And God said to me, I'm not looking for your works. This isn't about works. He said, I appreciate all that you're doing for me. He said, but this that I'm showing you isn't about sacrifice. It, it isn't about the works that you're doing. It's about an attitude of the heart. It, it's about a, 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 a position of humility that you don't have. Now, when God corrects you, he corrects you with his word. And sometimes people think that he corrects us but, you know, with a car accident or sickness or disease, but that's not true. He's a good God. He'll never do that. He'll correct you with his word. And when he did, I mean, literally, I wanted to crawl underneath the, the podium, the podium underneath the platform, because, I mean, he just cut me to my heart when he said that you're not worshiping me. But what he did is he took me to a scripture let me see if I can bring this up here real quickly. Uh, forgive me for looking away from the screen here a second. Um, it took me to go here, James, not James, I want to go to Romans. It took me to Romans and literally taught me a, a Greek word that I didn't know. Uh, where am I by it? Romans 12, verse number 1. So God literally took me to this verse. And now I'm familiar at that point primarily with King James, which is over here on the, on the right side of the screen. But uh, what it says here in King James, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, this word, reasonable service here, this is one word in Greek, I can click on it here, and it is the Greek word logikos. You can see it right here, logikos. And this word logikos, I, I didn't know this, God taught me this, but this word logikos, uh, translated here in King James as reasonable service, literally what the word means is worship. If we read the same verse in my favorite translation now, which is the most accurate, in my opinion, of the original Greek, let's read it there. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And this is what God taught me he, this, in this vision. He said to me, the worship that I am seeking, the worship that, that I'm looking for is for you to present your body a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. Or living, I missed the word holy. And he said to me, you have to see this from another perspective. And he then proceeded to show me that perspective with a continuation of the vision. And what happened is the sphere of light like disappeared and it was replaced with what looked like a battery. Now in this battery, like a car battery, and you, you, you probably know this, but in your car battery, you have two terminals. One is marked with a plus Oftentimes it's red, and the other terminal is marked with a minus. Now, literally what happens is you have this battery, and the inside is divided into uh, two compartments. Whoops, went the wrong way. Whoops. And in the positive side, if, if you can think of it this way, you have an abundance of energy. I mean, a tremendous amount of power. And what that power wants to do is to get over to the other side. But, but because there's a wall separating these, these here right in the middle, the, the power from the left or, or from the positive side cannot get over to the right side, the empty side. Uh, so it's, it's like trapped. So what happens is, 
if you were to take a screwdriver like I used to do in my younger years in hot wiring cars, but if you take a screwdriver like this red arrow represents here, and you cross the positive post to the negative post, and you connect those two, it creates what's called a direct short. And when you create a direct short, you provide a means for all of the power that's on the positive side to now escape into the empty side, and it's gonna flow through that, that metal shaft of the screwdriver. And what happens is when you touch that, the, the post there, you instantly get a very big spark, and it, it's hot, and, and uh, it literally will melt the tip off of screwdrivers, and I actually have a screwdriver that was once my dad's when I was a kid. I still have it, but the tip's gone, but it makes a great stirring stick today. But it reminds me of, of this all the time because of, of, of what it was used for. So here's the concept that God showed me. This is exactly what he was showing me in the vision. Because see, in his sphere of, of dominion, the, 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 the giant globe of light that he showed me, is all this energy. It's like in the sun. you got a tremendous amount of energy in the sun, in, in S-U-N. But, and also true, and S-O and amen. But you have all that energy in the sun. Well, what God wants to do is connect his power to us. And the, the vehicle that connects us is a humble and contrite heart, a repentant heart, a heart that says, God, I need you. I need your help. I need, I need you to fix me. I need you to go before me. I need you to show me what to do. I need you to show me how to do it. God, I so need you for everything, and I'm so thankful for, for a breath. I'm thankful for another day to serve you. It's, it's, it's an attitude of humility. It's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm teachable, I'm correctable, I'm open to instruction. God, oh God, I need you. You are the all-sufficient one, and I submit myself to you to show me whatever you want me to do. It's the open, and not the open heart, it's a condition of heart, it's humility, holy and contrite, to want to be what he wants you to be and to know you can't do it on your own. You need his word. You need his spirit. You need the holy angels. You need his helping hand. You need him to go before you. Yeah, you can open doors. Yeah, you can make things happen. But it's so limited compared to him. So what he showed me is when electricity moves, you can't see it. It's an unseen field of power. And it goes through, you know, th through these dimensions and, and, and it brings power. That's exactly what God is doing with you and I. He is providing because of an open heaven that we create because of a, a holy and contrite heart, a humble heart. It provides a pathway. It's like connecting the positive with the negative and the literally the grace and the glory and everything that is in his abundance is provided for us. Hallelujah. This uh, vision that God gave me was then replaced again. And in this vision, move me off the screen here. In this vision, what he showed me are, are stick magnets. Uh, again, this isn't the best, but this is not too far off from what God showed me. But if you take a stick magnet and take, take one of these magnets, Maybe you play with stick magnets as a child, as I did. But a stick magnet is polarized. It has a positive side and it has a negative side. Now, if you take two stick magnets, and they are both paralyzed, uh, paralyzed yeah, polarized, and if you put two negatives together or two po positives together, you know that if you try to push them together, you can't get them there because there's an unseen force working that as you're trying to push these two magnets together, they're repelling. They're opposing each other. Does that sound familiar? God opposes the pride. 
the proud. And when you have the negative heart, as it would be, when you are the negative uh, from a, I'm sorry, not negative, you're the positive in self-sufficiency. See, God is the all-sufficient one, amen? He is God Almighty. He is double-breasted, per se, in, in, in uh, well, what's the word there, not El Shaddai, but in the all-sufficient one. Amen, against El Shaddai. The all-sufficient one, I think it means double-breasted literally in the Hebrew. He, he has everything we need in, in, in access, in, in abundance, more than you and I could ever possibly imagine. But when we approach him with some level of self-sufficiency, you know, I can do it myself. I can do it without reading the word. I can do it without meditating on the word. I can do it without prayer. I can do it without fasting. I, I can do it without going to church. I can do it myself. It's self-reliance. And the more you are self-reliant, the more you are a positive, and God is the real positive one, but what happens is you, you're repelled by God because that positiveness is recognized by him as pride. And he opposes, he, he, he's opposed to the proud. But what happens is when you come to him with a contrite heart and humble heart and, and purpose to be repentant and holy, purpose to be holy at least, what happens is you're the negative because you know in yourself you're nothing. You know that... I can't do it by myself. I can only do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I come off of the throne. He is on the throne, and I'm submitted to the throne in an attitude of a weakness. I need him. I need you, God. Well, what happens is, just like electricity is an unseen field, so is magnetism. There's an unseen force of magnetism that is very, very powerful that causes these things to be attracted. And when I mean, if you have two magnets that are stuck together like this, I mean, you can shake them and they are not going to come apart because this unseen force is holding them together. It's called magnetism. Well, as strong as magnetism is, can't see it, but as strong as it is, as strong as electricity and powerful it is, imagine the lightning bolt. A lightning bolt. Now that you can see, but as powerful as that is, it's nothing compared to Almighty God and His ability to do for you what you can never do for yourself. Amen. So we want to open up the heavens. We want to we want to invite the the grace of God, the light of God, the provision of God to come and meet our every need. And that's what God taught me in the heart of humility. And when we walk in that heart, in that position of humility, what happens is we don't have to ask God for anything. He provides everything. He, as we can see in this last illustration here, he is the all-sufficient one, almighty God. And when we become the negative, we need him what happens is we attract him to us and he sticks to us. And it doesn't matter how much the world may shake. It doesn't matter how much things may, may move to the left or the right. He is going to hold you together by the unseen force of the power of his spirit for his glory. Amen. One more closing thought. And I didn't get this until many years later, but I recognized if we did this picture in reverse, and we put the, the sphere on top, and it was all negative, it would represent the devil. It would, it would represent the God of this world uh, in whom there is no light. It's all darkness. So it would be all black. Now, if it's all black, and, but there is a power, and there's a lot of power in the kingdom of darkness, but if we have this dark sphere, now... That, that, that power is going to work in reverse, but how, how does it touch the inhabitants on earth? By pride. Because what happens is when you become 
totally uh, self-sufficient in the New Age movement, you become a god in yourself. You become uh, one with the universe, per se. You become a god in yourself. You become an extreme positive, I can do all things through me. And that extreme positive is what opens the door to the powers of darkness connecting with you in making things happen, whether it's in witchcraft, sorcery, voodoo, various dimensions of the new age. They're pulling on a great power, but it is not God. It's coming through the power of darkness as they're submitting themselves to it through their own self-sufficiency and pride. But praise God, we are the redeemed of the Lord. And I, again, I'm, 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 I'm believing that through this tonight, that you have something going on in your heart, even right now, to say, God, forgive me for any level of selfishness, self-centeredness, and self-reliancy really is the key to this whole thing. And I'm just going to believe right now that as God has spoken to us, that there will be a work of his Holy Spirit that will minister to you uh, a cry of the heart to say, God, forgive me for doing any aspect of my life in myself, in my own self-sufficiency, doing it my way, doing it through natural ability as opposed to supernatural ability by your spirit. And God, forgive us for not putting a greater dependency on you. Positioning our hearts. Forgive us, Father God, for that mindset of we're able to do it without your help. And I pray, Lord God, that there would just right now just be a flow of your spirit that would minister to each one a supernatural provision from heaven. One of these light beams, Father God, I pray that one of these light beams would touch each one as they humble themselves right now under your mighty hand and they, they, they repent, they submit, and they know now more than before how desperate we are for your divine intervention, for your breath of spirit every day. Father God, I, I just thank you for the flow of that power and that anointing to minister to each one right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Well, trust you've been blessed tonight, refreshed, encouraged by the word. Let me just say thank you again for your prayers for, for me and the ministry and my family and the staff here at Dave Martin Ministries. Thank you so very much for your support. God's opened such a great door, stretching our tent pegs more and more. And uh, it's only because of faithful partners that we're able to continue to do what we're doing. And I just want to say a very, very special thank you for praying for us and supporting us financially, giving of your giving of what God's given to you. And I know many of you are even giving sacrificially. And I just want to say thank you for that. It's making a difference. And together, we will see over 100 million souls save disciples and serving God. And it's not going to be because we made it happen. It's going to be because we go through the doors God opened for us for his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we'll be back here again next Tuesday night. Have yourself a, a glorious week, a happy 4th of July, um, because I guess that's going to happen on Monday. And then next week we'll be in Milwaukee and Rockford. So those that can make to the meetings, love to see you there. And uh, we're going to be talking about the courts of heaven. And uh, we're going to be doing that, in, in fact, here on one of our Tuesday nights as well. But uh, that's what we're going to be doing in upcoming meetings here, talking about entering into the courts of heaven and uh, removing every obstacle that might be in our way. Amen. Well, if I can find a button here real quickly, I am going to uh, see if I can do this. Q&A session is over. Yeah. All right. Now you can all say good night one to another. Be blessed. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night.
Thank you for that word, Dave. I appreciate that. What a fantastic word. Thank you so much. Uh, you guys have a good day.